Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Leaf by each quivering green leaf. Here at Leaf by Leaf Enterprises, we realize that we don't have enough poetry on the channel. When I did my poetry bookshelf tour back in November, towards the end of last year, you know, I, I was so appreciative of everybody who gave me uh, such great recommendations. One of the recommendations that really stood out, probably because it coincided with the 2020 Nobel Prize winner for poetry, was Louise Gluck. So I quickly went out and got this volume. This is like a no-nonsense, bare-bones volume. No annotations, no footnotes, no anything. It's just the selection of the poetry from 1962 to 2012. But actually, this was really welcome because whenever I'm reading someone whom I'm reading for the first time, I don't, I don't want to know much at all. You know, some things are inevitably going to make their way into your predisposition, presupposition, whatever. But I don't like to go and read like a forward or an introduction or uh, any kind of critique or anything like that, any reviews. I like to go in cold. This Echo volume was very reasonably priced and a great way to get a good overview. So this starts off with uh, her first poetry collection, which is aptly titled Firstborn. And then it ends with the... 2009 collection of Village Life. So, you know, it's not comprehensive. Like I said, it leaves off in 2012. So she's had some volumes published since then, and she's got a new volume coming up this October or November that I've already pre-ordered. Louise Gluck, <laughs> she is one of those who pretty much right off the bat captured my heart. I think, I, you know, I talked about in my poetry bookshelf tour video that I don't read a lot of contemporary poetry. Most of the poet, poetry that I read, most of the poets that I read uh, are dead. You know, some of my favorites that uh, coincide with Gluck would include Emily Dickinson, uh, first and foremost, you know, with those really short lines that it's hard to even describe. They're dealing with everyday language and everyday situations, but they're touching at something profound. And it's in both the arrangements of the words on the page, but also with the passion, the feeling that is behind them. Now, that part can be a little deceiving because as a lot of people have pointed out with Gluck's poetry, it can seem that she's dispassionate or disinterested, that her emotions are, you know, abstracted from the poems, that they're just these severe, raw, visceral lines that aren't so much crafted as pressed into the paper to provoke coldly, if that makes any sense. But really, what I took from Gluck, especially as I got to the Wild Iris collection, which is probably her most popular, is that here we have someone who is actually bursting with conflagrations, fulminations, paroxysms of passion and emotion that yearns to transcend the container we all feel that we're in and communicate with our creator. And in fact, in the collection of criticism on Gluck, Change What You See, edited by Joanne Deal, in the back, there's a little conversation with Gluck, and she says, spiritual hunger has driven my work from the beginning. And you'll see in, in some of her collections, the Wild Iris again, you know, there are, commun there are different voices. This is polyphonic. And you have the voice of the creator, the voice of life in nature, flowers, and a human voice, all trying to communicate with one another. As Deal says in her introduction to this collection, surely Gluck is heir to the romantic sensibility, although the astringency of her poems speak to a singular voice that she shares with Emily Dickinson. That's very well put. No subject is too small or too insignificant to bear meaning for Gluck. I also love how as her collections begin to mature, as she begins to find confidence in her poetic voice, the 
poetry collections begin to be stretched out conversations, like intertextual, or I should say intra-textual communications with one another. So questions will be put forth in earlier poems that will then be answered by later poems. Personages from poems will communicate with personages from other poems. Also, uh, as we move on in the collection, some of her collections uh, begin to intertextually communicate and revive conversations with Homer, especially in the Odyssey and with characters like Odysseus and Telemachus and Penelope. She begins to consider what was going through the mind of, say, Penelope, something that we don't really get from Homer. Her interplay of nature and human relationships is one thing that is completely unflagging. It's apparent in all of her work. The best I can describe how her collections mature is that they become sort of integrated messaging systems. As I said, for some of the earlier collections, I went in cold and I just completely opened up myself to this author. So I just wanna read some different lines that stood out and started to pierce my heart from the very beginning without any context as it was for me. Moons whistle in their mouths through gasping muscles. Beyond her, wreathed in algae, links on links of breakers meet and disconnect foam through bracelets of seabirds foam through bracelets of seabirds the world is measured into row on row of unspiced houses painted to seem real and then several lines later this very short declarative sentence i have survived my life i took these pictures of the people in the war about a year ago their hands were opening to me like language the weeks go by, I shelve them, they are all the same, like peeled soup cans. Again, that epic of the ordinary. I watch the lone onion floating like Ophelia, caked with grease. This is looking into a frying pan at the food there. And it sort of connects with uh, the famous painting of Ophelia there in the pond. I can't think of that artist. It's a British artist, I think. It was also used um, as a symbol in Lars von Trier's Melancholia. Here's just one full poem, Cottonmouth Country, from her first collection. Fish bones walked the waves off Hatteras, presumably Cape Hatteras, here in North Carolina. And there were other signs that death wooed us by water, wooed us by land. Among the pines, an uncurled cottonmouth that rolled on moss reared in the polluted air. Birth. Not death is the hard loss. I know. I left a skin there. There's so much going on in these, what, eight lines. It's gorgeous. And this is her first collection. So let's skip on a little bit from departure in her house on marshland. And already in its deep groove, the train is waiting with its breath of ashes. The river films with lilies. I've always been a sucker for great verbs. And films, the river films with lilies, perfect. The moon throbbed in its socket. And so here we have the moon. Not only, not only is this just a sh striking sentence to read, and especially to read aloud. I should take a moment to say that these poems are best, well, all poems are best read aloud. Uh, but not only is it striking to hear the language, the moon throbbed in its socket, but we also see this uh, transposition of the moon in the sky with the moon being our eye in its socket. From her collection, The Mirror, so much pain in the world, the formless grief of the body whose language is hunger. I ask you, how much beauty can a person bear? Is it heavier than ugliness? Even the burden of emptiness is nothing beside it. I have to tell you what I've learned, that I know now what happens to the dreamers. They don't feel it when they change. One day, they wake, they dress, they are old. Wow. <laughs> and that's me, for sure. I'm a dreamer, and that's so true. You, you just don't feel these changes happening because... Half the time your head's in the clouds anyway, and you're seeing things through a romantic lens, and then 
the change just sort of happens all at once one day in the mirror. Yet, as she says in her collection, The Triumph of Achilles, first poem, The Reproach, what is a poet without dreams? I love this little haiku right here. Early summer, fog covers the mountains. Under each tree, a doily of shade. Listen to this little doublet. Why love what you will lose? There is nothing else to love. And I take that as a sincere answer, the, the reply, there is nothing else to love except the things you will lose. I take that as a sincere answer and not a, uh, a, a reinforcement of the previous line as uh, a rhetorical question, why love what you will lose. It's not chastising us. It's, it's just reaffirming that there is nothing else. We, we must love things that we will inevitably lose. I want to read this whole poem from the Wild Iris called Presqu'Isle, or Presque Isle. In every life, there's a moment or two. In every life, a room somewhere, by the sea or in the mountains. On the table, a dish of apricots, pits in a white ashtray, channeling Stevens, presumably. Like all images, these were the conditions of a pact. On your cheek, Trimmer of sunlight, my finger pressing your lips. The walls blue, white, paint from the low bureau, flaking a little. That room must still exist on the fourth floor with a small balcony overlooking the ocean. A square white room, the top sheet pulled back over the edge of the bed. It hasn't dissolved back into nothing, into reality. Through the open window, sea air, smelling of iodine. Early morning, a man calling a small boy back from the water. That small boy, he would be 20 now. Around your face, rushes of damp hair, streaked with auburn, muslin, flickered of silver, heavy jar filled with white peonies. How can you not love that? This is from the Meadowlands, and uh, this is where uh, you start to get a gluk who offers these quick little aphoristic jabs, such as this one. What if war is just a male version of dressing up, a game devised to avoid profound spiritual questions? And again, this gets back at the heart of Gluck. She herself said it, and that is the uh, element of profound spiritual questions. This is uh, from Parable of Flight in the Meadowlands collection. Last two stanzas. Does it matter where the birds go? Does it even matter what species they are? They leave here. That's the point. First their bodies, then their sad cries. And from that moment cease to exist for us. You must learn to think of our passion that way. Each kiss was real. Then each kiss left the face of the earth. And the this is another big element for Gluck is, you know, the, the rigors and, and hardships of human relationships. And, you know, lots of relationships, marriages are sort of on the brink. And there's this conversation that's going back and forth between the two parties, the two uh, soon to be estranged lovers. And it's almost as if, you know, the, the, the poem is a, a vessel or a pipeline of communication between the two, but they can't hear each other. It's out there for us, the readers. From the Seven Ages, this is uh, from the poem Ancient Text. If I was, in a sense, an obsessive staggering through time, in another sense, I was a winged obsessive. My moonlit feathers were paper. I lived hardly at all among men and women. I spoke only to angels. If that's not channeling Dickinson, I don't know what is. This is from Averno. It's called Omens, and this is the... Uh, last stanza. To such endless impressions we poets give ourselves absolutely. You hear how great this sounds out loud. To such endless impressions we poets give ourselves absolutely. Making in silence omen of mere event. Until the world reflects the deepest needs of the soul. That stanza for me is where I'm going to end in this video with uh, excerpts, because that sort of uh, sums up her whole enterprise. 
you know, that is exactly, you know, ma- making omens of mere events is exactly what Gluck does so well. And she wants to reflect not cold, detached, horrible relationships and, you know, the, the violence of naturalism, but rather the deepest needs of the soul. I spent about five months reading through this collection of her poetry, and it has made me uh, a better person, a better reader. Uh, It has made me, I I believe that it has increased my sensitivity to aesthetic beauty, which is always welcome. I can't wait to read uh, the collections that aren't included in here and her forthcoming publications. From the moment that I read the excerpt of her Nobel speech in the New York Review of Books, And she talked about how when she was five or six years old, she would stage poetry competitions in her head uh, between such luminaries as William Blake. I knew that I was probably going to love this poet or poetess, but I didn't know I was going to quite love her this much. So Gluck is now uh, (laughs) indelibly, ineluctably stitched into the fabric of my aesthetic sentiment, and I am forever grateful. Please, please, if you haven't yet, check out her poetry.